Our Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your grace, your goodness, your mercy, Father. We thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ, for which we have access to you, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that as the Word tells us, in this is demonstrated the love of God for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you, Father. That is not because we deserve it, it is in spite of the fact that we do not deserve it. How great a love you have for us, Father. And Father, how great a country do we live in, Father. And we thank you for this wonderful country that you've given us. We know you set America apart as a beacon for the gospel throughout the world, Father. And I know, Lord God, you're not finished with this nation. May you give us a vision and the courage, Father, to stand for righteousness, Father. We give you all the praise and the honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to share chat with you a little bit about freedom. But I want to talk about freedom from a historical standpoint. Before I do that, let me share with you, with you my favorite scripture about freedom. And that's Galatians chapter one, chapter 5, verse 1. And it says that for freedom's sake, Christ has made us free. So let us not entangle ourselves again with the yoke of bondage. That's a scripture that we really ought to keep close to our heart. Because we have put ourselves into bondage because of ignorance and apathy. You know, two preachers were talking the other day and one says to the other, let me ask you something. Do you feel that the problems with America are ignorance and apathy? And the other one said, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but reality, when we talk about religious freedom, that's what the birth of this country was all about. Do you realize that America is the only country on the face of the earth that was founded by men and women seeking the freedom to worship Almighty God. No other country on the face of the earth has been birthed on the Word of God. Only America. If you were living in England in the early 1600s, and you were not a member, a member of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, you were considered a heretic and you were persecuted. That's what brought the pilgrims to America. What a wonderful heritage. Have you stopped to think the heritage we have? God has truly set America apart. We are 4% of the population of the world. And again, this 4% has sent and supported over 85% of all the evangelism of the world comes out of this 4%. And uh, actually, I want to talk to you a little bit about history. I see several young people here, and it's very important that you understand history. You know, George Santayana said one time, if we do not learn the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat it. Let me say something else. We are in a battle. And let me address the young people. And this may sound harsh. <coughs> if we lose this battle, you will not have a future. It is for the future of our children and our children's children that we are in this battle. You know, there are those that will tell you, as a matter of fact, the majority of people will tell you the American Revolution started in the 1770s. That's not true. The American Revolution started in the 1730s with men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and others, preachers who were the heart of the first Great Awakening. And the first Great Awakening was the spark that ignited the American Revolution. As a matter of fact, you cannot separate the first Great Awakening and the American Revolution. They are one and the same. What we had in the 1700s was a dual revival. We had a spiritual and a political revival all tied into one. Let me give you an example. 
You look at the Declaration of Independence. I count 27 <coughs> grievances against King George in the Declaration of Independence. Did you know that each and every one of those grievances were preached from the pulpits of America for 10 years before Jefferson wrote them in the Declaration of Independence? It was preachers from the pulpits calling out King George for the atrocities that the British were perpetrating upon the colonies for 10 years. Preachers. As a matter of fact, my friend David Barton says you could consider the Declaration of Independence a series of sermon summaries. They're interesting. Now the question is, where are those preachers today? The majority of them are hiding behind their pulpits, scared to death of losing their tax exemption even though no church in America has ever lost its tax exemption from speaking about politics. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a very interesting uh, statistic that you may not have heard. Back in 2008, an organization called Alliance Defending Freedom decided, let's get together. They, got about, they were about 30 to 35 pastors. Let's pick a Sunday in October and let's all of us preach on politics. Let's each of us get a recording and send it to the IRS and dare them to sue us. About 30 pastors did it in 2008. 2009, about 80 pastors. 2010, 100 pastors. 2011, 586 pastors. 2012, over 1,600 pastors. Every year six, since then has been over a thousand pastors. You can go to the Alliance Defending Freedom website and Google or click on Pulpit Freedom Sunday. Over 3,500 pastors have done that. Do you know how many churches the IRS has gone after? Zero. It's an empty threat. Preachers are scared to death of not being politically correct. But it's about time they become biblically correct instead of politically correct. Scared to death of offending people. Having people leave the church and consequently income leave the church. If a pastor is more concerned about income than about serving God, something is wrong. Something is wrong. We got to be about our father's business. Just like Jesus said, I have to be about my father's business. We got the same call. We got to be about our father's business. But anyway, so it was preachers that actually gave us this country. As a matter of fact, the Constitution and the Declaration were solidly founded on the Word of God. As a matter of fact, Something that most people don't realize. Do you know where Paul Revere was going when he was going on his famous ride? The British are coming. The British are coming. Did you know that he was going somewhere? He was going to the home of a pastor. A pastor by the name of Jonas Clark. As a matter of fact, you guys know what was the first battle for our independence, right? What was it? First, it's not a trick question. <laughs> what was the first battle for our independence? <laughs> the, the Battle of Lexington, right? right? Did you know that the Battle of Lexington was fought right outside the church of Jonas Clark? And that Pastor Jonas Clark and all the men from his congregation were part of that militia? As a matter of fact, at the Battle of Lexington, eight colonists died. Seven of them were members of Pastor Jonas Clark's church. Second battle for our independence, the Battle of Concord, fought right outside the church at Concord. Again, the pastor and the members of the congregation were an integral part of that battle. Let me tell you about another pastor. 
This one is not too far from us. In this one was a pastor by the name of John Peter Muhlenberg from a town called Woodstock in Virginia. I was just in Virginia yesterday. That's why I said it's not too far. I was right next to Woodstock. I, I can't keep track where I'm at. I'm no longer in Virginia. I'm in New Hampshire now. Today. So anyway, this pastor, John Peter Muhlenberg, was one of many, many pastors greatly feared by the British Army. Anybody here ever seen the movie The Patriot? In the movie The Patriot, you saw the British burning a lot of churches. The reason they did that is because the men they feared the most were the pastors. You think the government today fears the pastors? No, they laugh at the pastors and they use them as pawns. You just stay in your, stay in your churches, singing hallelujah while the country is going down the drain. You stay in there. You know, Hitler did the same thing. Hitler went to the pastors, put his arms around them and said, you take care of their souls inside of the church, I'll take care of the nation. And because the church did not get involved, six million Jews were exterminated. And I'll tell you what, it is said that when the trains, those churches that were close to the railroad tracks, when the trains were going by, taking Jews to the camps, that they would just sing their hymnals louder so they wouldn't hear the train going by. God help us. The time to be passive has long passed. But anyway, we, it, it is, we got to realize God did not call us to be passive. As a matter of fact, do you know that the word church in the Greek is the word ecclesia? Do some research on the ecclesia. The ecclesia was the most influential people in Greece. They were the people that actually were the leaders of the society. But the church is relegated now to a place that you go to on Sunday. And then you live like the devil the rest of the week. And no wonder the church's influence upon society has become less and less and less. Because the church has acquiesced its influence. Anyway, the framers, you hear from the liberals, you hear from the secular media, all the framers were a bunch of secularists. Nothing could be further from the truth. Did you know that 29 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were seminary graduates? They were theologians. As a matter of fact, when the liberals and the secularists talk about the framers, they only like to talk about two of them. The ones they call the ungodly framers, the theists. You know who those are, those are right? <laughs> Jefferson and Franklin. Let me tell you about those two men. First, Thomas Jefferson. When Thomas Jefferson was vice president, in the third year as of his vice presidency, of course, as vice president, he was also the president of the Senate. Right? The vice president is the one who presides in the Senate. As vice president, Jefferson wrote an order authorizing church services to take place in the rotunda of the Capitol. Those services started the third year of Jefferson's vice presidency. Jefferson attended every Sunday those services as vice president. And the eight years that he was president, he would ride his horse from the White House every Sunday to the Capitol building to attend those services. Those services lasted for 65 years with as many as 2,000 people in attendance. <clears throat> Does that sound like separation of church and state to you? No. As a matter of fact, do you realize that one of the very first Bibles printed in America 
was printed under the auspices of Congress to be the principal textbooks in primary schools, high schools, and universities. Was so for over 150 years, until in 1963, the Supreme Court banned the Bible from schools. As a matter of fact, prior to 1962, everybody prayed in school before school started. Some schools, they prayed before every class. The year before the Bible was banned, in 1962, they banned prayer, prayer from schools. But you know what? In spite of those two abominable decisions, the church remained silent. Their excuse is a political issue. How can you call prayer a political issue? How can you call Bible study a political issue? But that's exactly what the church did. You know what the consequence of that silence was? Teen pregnancy skyrocketed after 1963 and so did violent crime. All as a result of removing the Bible and prayer from schools. Ten years later, 1973, nine unelected justices to the Supreme Court decided that a baby in the womb did not have that unalienable right to life from our Creator, as stated in the Declaration of Independence. And they legalized abortion. Again, the church remained silent. The same excuse. It's a political issue. 58 million babies have been murdered in America through abortion. That's the consequence of that silence. The blood of 58 million babies is crying out to God, just like the blood of Abel. We as the church of the living Christ need to fall on our faces in corporate repentance for the sin of abortion. The question is, how long are we going to remain silent? But you know there's a more important question. Are we going to have to answer to God for our silence? Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany once said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. He also said, not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. You see, our silence shouts very, very loudly. Proverbs 17, 15 says, He who justifies the wicked, or he that condemns the just, both of them are an abomination to the Lord. He that justifies the wicked. If you're silent, are you not justifying the wicked? How can we be silent when we see Planned Parenthood butchering babies that are being aborted alive to harvest body parts? Oh, I can't talk about that. That's political. No, that's not political. That's the heart of our society. And we are supposed to be the guiding light for our society. The church should be the ecclesia. The one that guides and directs the rest of society. And the church has acquiesced because of political correctness. God help us. We have what we have in America today because the church has failed. You know, a couple of years ago, I was at a pastor's conference. I heard a statistic that really burdened my heart. It was from George Barna, who does surveys among evangelical Christians. George Barna stated that in the 2012 election, there were 12 million evangelical Christians not registered to vote, and another 26 million that didn't vote. That's a total of 38 million evangelical Christians out of a total of 89 million. That's about 40% of the church that didn't vote. We get what we deserve. Proverbs 29.2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked beareth rule, people mourn. Well, if the righteous, the people that are relying not in their own self-righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, 
that walk and live by the Judeo Christian principles upon which this nation was built. When those people are in authority, there is peace, there is prosperity, there is harmony, people rejoice. When the wicked, those who trample upon the principles upon which this, this country was built, when those people are in authority, we got chaos, we got unemployment, we got crime, people mourn. But if the righteous are not voting, if the righteous are not even running for office, what is left? The wicked electing the wicked. <coughs> and it becomes our fault. I'll tell you what, we have been deceived and we have begun to believe a bunch of lies. Let me tell you a very common lie that most of the church believes. I've heard so many preachers say this, it makes me sick. And it is this statement, politics cannot legislate morality. That is a lie. Politics legislates morality all the time. What do you think it was when the government legislated prayer out of school? When they legislated the Bible out of school? When they legalized abortion? When they are trying to cram down our throats, same-sex marriage? When now they are trying to pollute the mind of our kids with common core? Is that not legislating morality? But if the wicked are in authority, they are going to legislate their wicked brand of morality. How do we change that? We have to have the righteous in authority. And for the righteous to be in authority, we have to have the righteous voting for the righteous. It's the only way. As a matter of fact, if you read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you find a 100% correlation. Every time Israel or Judah had a righteous king, there was peace, there was prosperity, the whole country followed the Lord. Conversely, every time Israel or Judah had a wicked king, the whole country went to idolatry, there was chaos, there was war, there was famine. As the king went, so went the people. 100% correlation. Because of that, what was the principal ministry of all the major prophets? Whether it is Isaiah, or Jeremiah, or Elijah, or Elisha, their primary ministry was to call the king to repentance. It was a political ministry. Call the king to repentance because only we see righteousness when the king follows righteousness. As a matter of fact, for millennia, the model for government has always been the same. This is a man-made model. I want you to understand because I've had people say amen when I mention this model because well, this is not God's model. This is man's model. And this model, man-made model, is this. Authority flows from God to the government to the people. Even in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people of Israel come before the prophet Samuel demanding, we want a king like all the nations around us have a king. You see, before then, they were ruled by judges that arose from among the people. Now they put themselves up upon that same man-made model. Authority flows from God to the government to the people. How did that work out? Well, you read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. It worked out so bad that they ended up 70 years in slavery in Babylon. But you see, when the framers were on their knees, and I believe without a shadow of a doubt that the Constitution of the United States of America was a divinely inspired document because it was conceived on the knees of the framers. 
Those framers were praying, seeking revelation from God. And revelation is what they got. And God gave them a totally different model for government. No longer authority flows from God to the government to the people. Because you see, throughout history, kings and tyrants have used that model to justify their oppression of the people. Their reasoning goes like this. I have the right to oppress you because my authority comes from God. I have the right to take your land because my authority comes from God. I have to, the right to take everything you own because my authority comes from God. But God gave the framers a different model. No longer authority flows from God to the government to the people, but rather authority flows from God to the people to the government. From God to the people to the government. All authority under the Constitution by inspiration of God is placed upon we the people. And with that authority comes an awesome responsibility for us to elect righteous leaders. It's not coincidental that the first three words of the Constitution are what? We the people. You see, when you understand that, you get a totally different understanding of Romans 13, which says that God appoints all authority. Well, in America, the authority that God appointed is not the president, it's you. Because you have the authority to decide who you make president by your vote. The authority is placed upon we, the people. Not upon a king. We don't have a king. You are the king and the queen. You are the one that God gave the stewardship to make sure we have righteous leadership. You look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 13. And God, speaking through Moses, says to the people of Israel, You choose, not God, God upon, you choose from among you wise men, and I will set them up as rulers of all your tribes. You choose from among you wise men. You choose, you elect. Exodus chapter 18, verse 21. God speaks through Jethro to Moses. Here's Moses in the wilderness trying to govern a million people. I'm going nuts. And here comes Jethro and says, Moses, what you're doing is not good. And in Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, God speaks through Jethro to Moses. And he says, you select from among the people. Again, just like Deuteronomy 1.13. Not God will appoint. You select. Which is the same as you elect. And then God gives four qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Let's take it one at a time. Able men. And women, of course. What does that mean? That means elect men and women who are capable of doing the job. Let's stop electing the village idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, such as fear God. Well, if you fear God, you obey God's command. You obey God's precepts. We call that in America a Judeo-Christian ethic. What is a Judeo-Christian ethic? Well, first of all, it's a moral code of conduct depicted in the last six commands in the Decalogue, the horizontal commands. And then it's honesty, integrity, hard work, individual responsibility, the rule of law, and yes, free enterprise and limited government. And the Bible has a lot to say about this. A woman such as fear God, number three, Men of truth. Let me ask you a question. Are you sick and tired of men and women of lies in government? Yes. I mean, they tell you one lie to cover up the previous lie. <laughs> and it's lies upon lies upon lies. Whether it is Fast and Furious, or Benghazi, or the IRS, or the NSA, or Ebola, or the missing emails, 
or money from foreign governments, or the Iran deal, or Planned Parenthood. It is nothing but lies upon lies upon lies. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever come across a candidate for public office that will tell you all these wonderful things they're going to do, only to get elected and do exactly the opposite when they get elected? Anybody have had that experience? Yeah. That one is easy to fix. All you have to do is follow this simple rule. Stop listening to their rhetoric and start looking at their record. Stop listening to what they say. Start looking at what they do and what they have done. Jesus put it this way. Ye shall know them by their fruits. It's about time we do some fruit checking. They all have a record. <laughs> Don't listen to what they say. They're going to tell you what they think you want to hear. I've heard politicians tell you I'm pro-life who voted pro-abortion 17 times. Don't believe them. Look at the record. So able men, such as fear God, men of truth, number four, hating covetousness. You know something very interesting about covetousness in government? It's not really about money. It's about power and control. Politicians covet power. And they covet the control that power gives them over we the people. That's why we have politicians in Washington that have been there for 30 years. And they're going to be there another 20. That's why we need term limits. So they go to Washington, do their job, and go back home, go back to work. Instead of living on a government pension for the rest of their lives. So, now you know how to vet a candidate. God tells you four qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Exodus 18, 21 continues. And he says, and I will set them up as rulers of thousand, rulers of hundred, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. So the model you have is Moses, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. That's equivalent to federal government, state government, county government, local government. Verse 22. And only take up to Moses, that is to the federal government, matters of great importance. Everything else you handle yourself at the local level. That is the essence of federalism. That is the essence of limited government. That's Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. That's the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution is called the Enumerated Powers of Congress. Eighteen powers described in Article 1, Section 8. If it's not there, federal government's got no business being involved in it. Let me give you one example. The word marriage, nowhere in Article 1, Section 8. The Supreme Court had no jurisdiction to rule on marriage. No jurisdiction. Their, their opinion, and take it very clear, the Supreme Court cannot create law. They can only render opinions. But their opinion was unconstitutional and unlawful, and they had no jurisdiction even to make that opinion. So, and... Anything that is not in Article 1, Section 8, according to the 9th and 10th Amendment, is reserved to the states. Let me give you a couple of other words that are not in Article 1, Section 8. The word environment. <laughs> Nowhere in Article 1, Section 8. There is no agency of the federal government that has done more harm to this country than the EPA. The thousands upon thousands upon thousands of regulations that are strangling businesses all across America. Did you know that the Clean Water Act has just been expanded to now regulate a puddle in your backyard? I mean, this is the regulations are killing us. Let me tell you another word that is not in Article 1, Section 8. It's the word education. And does it make any sense to have a bunch of unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., 
telling us how to educate our children and grandchildren and trying to cram down our throats something as insidious and horrible as Common Core, which is nothing but brainwashing and trying to just program your kids with secular humanism and socialism and Marxism. Common Core has nothing to do with standards. It has everything to do with controlling your kids and brainwashing them into a secular humanist worldview. No, education is too important to left to those unelected bureaucrats. It needs to be handled at the local level by parents, teachers, and perhaps a local school board at the local level. But you see, it's become our fault because we've been silent. We have been so passive that we've allowed the government to encroach upon our liberties. I'll quote again one more time, Galatians 5.1. For freedom's sake, Christ has made us free. So do not entangle yourselves again with the yoke of bondage. But that's what we've done. But you see, it's like the old story of the frog. You throw a frog in a pot of hot water, he'll jump right out. But put a frog in a pot of cold or cool water and put that water on the stove. That frog is comfortable. That frog is complacent. You can boil that frog to death. And that's the problem with us. They've been taking our freedoms away from us a little at a time and a little more, and a little more, and we keep taking it. And we are being boiled to death, just like that frog. I want to leave you with five action steps. First of all, we need to understand that voting is our responsibility, <coughs> our civic responsibility. All over America, I've been telling churches, you need to have a voter registration table in the lobby of your church. And I've had many pastors say, oh, I can't do that. That's a political issue. That's not a political issue. That's not a partisan issue. That's a civic responsibility. You cannot vote unless you're registered to vote. I, was, I work with several different groups doing pastors' conferences all over America. I've done over well over 100 pastors' conferences in the last two years. One of the groups that I've done about 30 pastors' conferences with, they promote what they call Stand Up Sunday. And they encourage, why don't you, pastor, at the end of the service, say, all right, all those of you that are registered to vote, please stand. And then say to the ones that are sitting down, go right out the door, there's a voter registration table, right up there, go register. <laughs> Well, I was talking to Pastor John Hagee in San Antonio one time. And I mentioned that to him, and he says, I do one better than that. I ask the people who register to vote to stand, and then I have the ushers pass voter registration cards to everybody sitting down. <laughs> well, I am in Albuquerque, New Mexico, preaching at a very large church. I mentioned that to this pastor. He said, oh, I do one better than that. <laughs> I asked the people who registered to vote to stand, then I have the ushers pass voter registration card to everybody sitting down. Then I put a PowerPoint with a voter registration card and said, get a pen, we're going to go through it line by line, let's fill it out right now. <laughs> I said, my hat's off to you. <laughs> but you see, if you don't vote, you have no right to complain. Amen. You become part of the problem. Right. And you cannot vote unless you're registered to vote. So you need to encourage everyone who is not registered. I told you, close to 50% of Christians do not vote. No wonder we have the ungodly ruling us. Because the Christians have been sitting on their pews, singing hallelujah inside the four walls while the country is going down the drain. Or sitting in their couches at home watching the idiot box. <laughs> We need to get engaged. Number two, we need to be preaching from the pulpit the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God goes from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. But let me tell you what many churches do in America. 
They read the Bible with a pair of scissors. Well, this particular passage of scripture does not go in accordance with, quote, my denominational doctrine. Let's cut it out. And different denominations cut out different passages. The majority of pastors across America have cut out Romans chapter 1 because it's not politically correct. Do you know that in Canada today, if you preach on Romans chapter 1, you will be put in prison? It's called hate speech. This administration has been trying for the last six years to pass hate speech. And they're still trying. This may be the next step. But who are we trying to please? God or man? I'll tell you what, for those of you who think it's all right to cut passages of scripture out, read the last chapter of Revelation. Amen. Read what it says about those who are subtracted from the word of God. It's not, it's, I mean, it's pretty serious. So number two, we need to be preaching the whole counsel of God. You know, the same man I talked to you about a few minutes ago, George Barnum. He did a survey this time among evangelical pastors. He asked them one question. Do you believe that the Bible addresses every issue facing America today? 90% said yes. And that sounds great, doesn't it? Until you hear the second question. Second question was, do you preach on the biblical solutions to those problems? Less than 10% said yes. That means 80% of those pastors know the truth and refuse to preach on it because it's not politically correct. God help us. It becomes our fault. You see, if the shepherd is not leading the sheep, the sheep are scattered like sheep without a shepherd. The shepherd has a responsibility to lead the sheep because many people are looking for guidance. What better place to get guidance in every area of life, including politics, than from the pastor? He's supposed to be the head of the ecclesia. Look up that word, ecclesia, and see what it meant in the Greek society. They were the influencers, where the church has ceased to be the influencer upon society. But that's not the way it was. As a matter of fact, if you read, especially the history of New England, did you know that many of the cities we have in this part of the country were started by pastors and their congregations. And the pastors got together, all the congregation, they built homes, and they said, well, uh, how do we do this government thing? And they set up the city government. They set up the state government. Pastors. See, we totally divorce ourselves from our history. We need to get back to our roots. The whole concept of separation of church and state has no basis whatsoever. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Declaration. But you see, if we divorce them, if we divorce them, then what we do is we acquiesce and give back to the old model. We give the authority back to the king instead of having the authority upon we the people. God gave us that authority so that we be good stewards and elect righteous leaders. Number three, we need to encourage people of faith. We need to encourage pastors, Sunday school leaders, deacons to run for public office. Let me give you two examples very quickly. One example was from a city in Houston called Pearland, Texas. A pastor, very close friend of mine, his name is Dr. Rick Scarborough. Dr. Rick Scarborough was one day sitting at his office, and uh, at a high school there was a lady doing an assembly on sexuality. 
because the high school was so big, the assembly was done twice, in the morning and in the afternoon. And about noon, a person from the church comes and says, but, but, Pastor Rick, you need to go to that assembly this afternoon. And Pastor Rick says, well, I'm really busy. And this guy said, no, 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 you don't understand, Pastor Rick. you got to be there. And he gave him a little preview. So he goes there this after that afternoon, and he says, this was a lecture on pornography. Mm -hmm. The whole afternoon, he said, it was so bad. He was shocked. Fortunately, he had his dictaphone. Probably his kids don't even know what a dictaphone is. <laughs> it's like an old, old, old recorder. And he had his dictaphone and he recorded the whole thing. And then he put in the marquee of his church. This Sunday I will be talking about this lecture on sexuality at the high school. Well, his church was packed that Sunday. There were even cameras there. And what he did was he read the transcript of that tape. And then he looked at his congregation. And he said, how many of you can run for city council? How many of you can run for school board within one election, less than two years? Three of the five members of city council came from that church. Four of the seven members of the school board came from that church, and they changed school policy. That's what happens when the righteous are in authority. Let me give you another example. In the city of Houston, Texas, last year, Houston, Texas, we've had a homosexual mayor. She passed an ordinance called the bathroom ordinance, which said if a man felt like a woman, he could walk into the women's bathroom. And let's say your daughter was in that bathroom and she objected. That man could sue your daughter for violating his civil rights. This is crazy. Well, five pastors decided to mobilize the churches. Because of that, the mayor was so enraged that she subpoenaed the sermons of those five pastors. And all five said, we will not comply, we'll listen yet. The next morning, my son called his pastor. He's a member of First Baptist Church in Houston. And he said, Pastor Greg, I guess you heard what happened yesterday afternoon. And Pastor Greg said, yes, Dad, I'm very concerned. So my son said, Pastor, I want to have a pastor's rally tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I was calling you to see if you would give me permission to do it at the sanctuary of the church the pastor begins to laugh over the phone. And so my son says, why are you laughing? He says, you know, that about a month ago, I was so concerned with what's happening in our city, what's happening in our nation. I talked to a bunch of pastors. I have 50 pastors coming to my office tomorrow at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Only God can do that. <laughs> so they joined them. And they were all on their knees from 10 to 11. At this time, this, all these pastors came from the, to the sanctuary. By this time, there were about 500 people there. And all 50 of these pastors said, Caesar has no jurisdiction over the pulpit. Mm -hmm. That weekend, there was another rally with thousands of people. Someone got the idea, why don't we start sending the mayor Bible? She got thousands of Bibles. Well, the pressure was so large, she had to remove the subpoena. But still, this ordinance was in effect. These five pastors mobilized all the churches. They got a referendum just this last two weeks ago. They won by 62-38, and they repealed that ordinance. How the churches got involved, they got all their congregations involved, they went and voted out that ungodly ordinance by a referendum. That can only happen if the church gets involved. we got to be involved. You know, just two days ago in my city, in the city of Dallas, they passed the same ordinance. Nobody knew what was coming. They did it on the closed doors. We are already mobilizing the pastors in Dallas. And we will defeat it. But we got to get involved. If the church does not get involved, let me tell you something sad. 
Houston, that mayor got elected, when she got elected, only 16% of the population of Houston voted. Mm -hmm. So she got elected by a little more than 8%. Mm -hmm. So what happens? The church is not involved. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, I can't be involved in politics. Politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of it. The only reason politics is a dirty business is because the righteous are not involved in politics. I'm going to quote one more time Proverbs 29.2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, people mourn. And I repeat again. We're not talking about your own self-righteousness. We're talking about the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of the Word of God, the righteousness upon, of the principles upon which this country is built upon. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, people mourn. When the righteous are only going to be in authority, if the righteous vote the righteous into power. What would have happened if 10% more of the church had been involved in voting? That mayor would have never been elected. 16% of the population voting. What happened to the other 84%? Where are they? And this has happened in the Bible Belt. Yeah. If the people that are in this room will touch their neighborhoods, you could turn New Hampshire right side up. We got to be involved. Let me tell you, one, this group that I'm working with has now 500 pastors committed to run for public office. I have pastor friends of mine that are state representatives, that are state senators, that are county commissioners, that are city councilmen, that are mayors, that are sheriffs. And you know what? They're still pastoring. They got two advantages. Number one, they have a whole congregation praying for them. And number two, they are bringing the principles of the word of God into the legislation. God knows we need it. Because if we are run by ungodly principles, we're going to reap the consequences. So, again, we must get people of principle running for public office. And then, number four, we need to get informed as citizens of where these candidates stand. Like I said before, don't listen to the rhetoric, look at the record. Don't listen to what they say. Look at what they do. Check the fruit. So we need to get informed as to where they stand. And number five, go conviction instead of tradition. There are people that vote for a particular party because their parents and their grandparents voted for that party, regardless of what the party stands for. No, no, no. Vote for men and women that uphold the principles of the Word of God, the principles upon which we live. If we do that, we will see America restored again to that shining city on a hill to the glory of God. Thank you and God bless your pastor.